Good morning. How we doing? Awesome. You ready for winter? No. Yeah, I don't know. Woo! Yeah. All right. My driveway faces north, and so I'm not ready for winter. Just going to be honest with you. Just going to be honest with you. That was the one thing that was on my list when we bought this house three years ago that I, I would never do another driveway facing north. But when we walked in and we saw the wood floors, I'm like, okay, we have to buy this house. So anyway. All right. Hey, we are in week four of Unhindered. I am so glad that you guys are here today. Uh, as we continue this series. And I just want to remind you of a few quick things. Unhindered is about this, two things, to provide for God's work today and then pursue God's plan for tomorrow. And uh, we are in a generosity initiative. We want to uh, raise some money, raise some capital for a future building. Uh, just like we walked in today and we shared with you uh, just the challenges of being a mobile church. Uh, this is our second service and we're packed wall to wall. And the reality is, is we need a, a permanent location. And we've been prayerful about it. And now it's time to uh, put some uh, flesh to this uh, vision that God has put on our heart. And uh, that's what we've been talking about over the last several weeks. And so if you haven't been with us week one, I cast vision and shared with you, what are we trying to do? We're trying to raise $1.2 million over the next 24 months um, for two things, to provide for the work that we're doing today. We need to do all of our ministries in a level of excellence and uh, running and operating a church just costs money, plain and simple. Our rent, our insurances, salaries, uh, resources, uh, Bibles that we buy, ministries, we support all that stuff. But also we need to, out of the overflow of that, we need to raise some money for a future building or our property. With that, people keep asking me, Patrick, do we want a building or a property? And the answer is yes, we want them both, okay? Um, we either or, whatever God's design and plan is for this church, we're open to his calling on our life. Uh, the most optimal is to have an existing building that we can remodel and get in right away. But uh, building from the ground up is super expensive. Uh, but if that's God's plan, guess what? Guess who's going to provide that money for us? He will. I believe with all my heart. So um, just kind of let you know about that. So week two, we talked about Mary and how much she had a deep trust for the Lord. This is a young Jewish lady. Uh, she was anywhere from the ages of about 13 to 15 years old. And her call calling on her life was to be the mommy of the Messiah. What a big job. What a huge responsibility. And she said, God, if that's your will, I'm all in, is what she said. And so I want us to be a church that trusts like Mary Trust. Last week, we looked at Genesis chapter 22 and Abraham, and he was asked to sacrifice his son. And we looked at some principles when it comes to sacrificing that we want to do it quickly, completely, and cheerfully. That's really, really important. We looked at how Abraham did that. And one of the things that I shared, if you weren't here, I want you to hear this, that when it comes to sacrifice, it's not what you you lose, it's what you gain. And as we sacrifice to become a church that's unhindered, we're going to gain a property. We're going to gain a place where people are going to know Jesus. We're going to gain a place where our faith is going to grow, and we're going to be a bigger blessing to our community. So we have so much to gain when we sacrifice, when we say yes to becoming unhindered. Now today we are going to look at the third trait of unhindered people, and I believe that's having a generous heart. And so I will let you know up front, this is a message about giving money, okay? I'm just going to lay it out there. And if you are a first-time guest, I'm not sorry you're here, okay? I'm so glad you're here. It's uh, the awkward, you know, you invite your friend, you're like, oh man, I wonder what the pastor's going to teach on today. Is it going to be really cool? And he's like, he's going to teach on giving, okay? So I just wanted to throw that out right away from the very beginning. That's what we're going to look at. And I pray that you're going to be encouraged by uh, the scriptures that we're going to look at. And what is it really true to mean for us to have a generous heart through our giving? And it's really a heart issue is what it is. It's really a heart issue. And I believe the number one spiritual indicator for someone is how they give financially. Because here's the deal. There is this battle for your attention, your affection, and your worship between God and between money. That's where it lies. Did you know the battle? There's no battle between God and Satan because that's been done and finished and completed. When Jesus is on the cross, he says, it is finished. It is completely done. And so today we're going to take a look at that I wanted to start by sharing this. Uh, Mark Dillon, he's a professor at Wheaton College, and he wrote a book called Giving and Getting in the Kingdom. And he has identified four types of basic givers. And I wanted to go over those with you. Number one is called the reluctant giver. It's about 50% of the population. Talking about giving is annoying to this group. Their mantra is, my money is my business. So if that stat is true for the culture, that means about half the people in this room. So from here over, you're completely annoyed today at me. And it's okay. So I'm just going to talk to this side. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Reluctant giver. Because I was in sales for 12 years. And I know what it's like to be a commissioned salesman. And you know, doggone it, I work my tail off. It's my money. I earned it. I'm going to spend it how I want it. 
I've been there. I know exactly what a reluctant giver is like because that used to be me. Number two is called a casual giver, 25% of the population, and they give out of obligation. They ask, how much money should I give? Pastor, just tell me, I'll just write the check, how much you want me to give, we'll be done with this, and we'll just move on to something bigger and better. Number three is called a thoughtful giver. This is about 20% of the population. They are aware of God's call on their life and their possessions. These folks, they receive pleasure and joy from giving back to God. They ask, how much of God's money should I give back to him? That is a thoughtful giver. And then the last one is called the gifted giver. It's about 5% of the population. They take great joy in giving. Their question is not if they should give or how much they should give. Listen to this question. This is so good. How much of God's money should I keep? If you believe that it's all the Lord's, your time, treasure, talents, your health, your bank account, your home, your cars, your kids, everything. It's not yours. You're simply a steward. You're a manager. You're just taking care of what God's entrusted you here on this earth. That's the kind of question. And here's the question. I want to read it again. How much of God's money should I keep? And it's really a difference in your perspective. And I want you to know it's hard to change that perspective because of the culture we live in. Because the culture we live in says more is better, you need more. A two-car garage is not enough. You gotta have at least a four-car garage. And you know, 3,000 square foot home is not enough. You need a 6,000 square foot home. Uh, your car or your truck, guys, it's not fast enough. You need one that goes faster with more horsepower. Can I get an amen, guys, on that one? I know you guys in your trucks. Come on. I was having a conversation uh, with a guy today in the first service, and we were talking about uh, a, a friend of ours has this really nice uh, muscle car, and the first time he started up in his garage, it literally shook the walls. And you're like, oh, man, that is awesome. And he goes, man, aren't you glad you don't drive an electric car, Patrick? And I said, yes, I'm so thankful I don't drive an electric car. And so this is the kind of giver that God is. I want you to know God is a gifted giver. He's a gifted giver. Uh, he, he has kept nothing back from us. He's kept nothing back from you. He's given his best and he's given his all in, in his son, Jesus. I want you to think about this, that you're here today because Jesus left the riches of heaven and he became poor and he didn't hold anything back. We learn this in Philippians chapter two, verses six and seven. It says this, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be clung to. Instead, he gave up divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. I want you to know God's nature is a gifted giver. You know, it says he didn't cling to he wrapped his son in flesh and he sent him to earth. Think about that. When we think of something you cling on to, you, man, you've got this white knuckle, you are going to hold on to it as hard and as tight as you can. And I want you to know the, the things of this world are vying for our affection to cling to. And God, he is an open-handed God. And I want us to be an open hand church. And not just an open hand where our hand is up because something can still set in my hand right here. I want to live a life where my hand is palms down. Like, there's nothing that I'm going to cling to. There's nothing I'm going to grasp. I just want to live a life where God's going to bless me and I'm just going to let it go on to other people, whether it's my time or my treasure or my talents, whatever it is. That's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of church I want us to be. And I want you to know there is a lot of gifted givers in this church already. We have a gifted God and we've been called to reflect his nature. I want you to think on this. It also said he gave up divine privileges. Jesus was in heaven standing at the right hand of God. And he says, you know what? It's time for you to go down there to earth and you're gonna be born of this virgin. You're gonna live for 33 years and you're going to encounter everything that you encounter. Pain, sorrow, grief, joy, exhilaration, anything and everything, you're going to experience it firsthand. And why did he do that? It's because he wanted to restore the relationship between man and God. And the only way to do it was through Jesus. And I want you to put yourself in Jesus' shoes for just a moment. You're in heaven in all of its glory. It's awesome. There's no pain, there's no sorrows, there's no tears, there's no cancer, there's no bankruptcy, there's no divorce, there's no loss of a drunk driver accident. There, I mean, there's nothing, it is glorious. And Jesus said, you know what, I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna wrap myself in flesh because he's a gifted giver. And we've been called to reflect that. He took the position of a slave. I shared with you four weeks ago, five weeks ago about serving and how Jesus served until death that I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And what did he do to his uh, disciples' feet? He washed their feet the night before his death. And then he died the worst death of all time, crucifixion. 
I believe one of the greatest ways that we can be more like Jesus is through a giving heart and our time, our treasure, and our talents. So my question for you this morning, what kind of giver are you? Are you reluctant? That when I talk about money or we look at passages in the Bible about money, you're like, oh, I'm so annoyed. Or are you a casual giver? Like, okay, what is this going to cost me? What do we need to do? I'll, I'll throw in a 20. Or are you a thoughtful giver? Like it's been thought out. Like, no, I'm going to give methodically. I'm going to give systematically. I love giving to the work of the church and making Jesus famous. Or are you a gifted giver? Well, this morning we're going to look at what is it going to take for us as a church to be gifted givers. Open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to look at what Scripture talks about and teaches about gifted giving. You guys ready to do this? Okay, all right. I love the back row over here. This is awesome. <laughs> gifted givers. So I want you to know, church, teaching and preaching on giving, it, it's hard, because I know it's hard because it's hard for where you're sitting to listen to this. It's a tough subject, but we're, I'm going to show you some stuff in Scripture that I, I pray it encourages you today uh, in this. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me tell you what's going on. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, and Corinth is, uh, it's very worldly. Everything that you could ever want and imagine is in this community, uh, and it's like a modern-day Las Vegas. That's the best way for me to describe it. Um, very paganistic, lots of gods, all kinds of pleasures and joys of this world that you ever want were found in Corinth. And so uh, they need to raise some money for the church back in Jerusalem. And so a year prior, Paul talks to the church here in Corinth about, hey, the church in Corinth, they're being persecuted by the Roman government and financially they need some help. And so the, the church at Corinth rises up and they say, yeah, we're going to do this. And so, and we're going to start in verse seven. This is what it says. Since you excel in so many ways, I want you to circle that word excel. Excel in many ways. In your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love from us. I want you to excel. There's that word again, circle it. Also in the gracious act of giving. Verse eight, it says, I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine our love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. Verse nine, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich. He's talking about his death. He made you rich because of the relationship that you have with Jesus. There's nothing more richer, there's nothing more sweeter, there's nothing more grander than being in a relationship with Jesus, period. Nothing compares Nothing compares, is what he's telling the church. Verse 10, this is what Paul says. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to wish that you had started a year ago. Last year, we were with, last year you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first in doing it. He said a year ago, we're raising money for the church in Jerusalem. They're being persecuted. I came to you and said, hey, they need some financial help. Will you help? And they were eager. They were generous, like, yes, we want to help. How do we do it? And so Paul takes some money back to the church in Jerusalem. Verse 11, it says, now you should finish what you have started. Let the eagerness you've showed in the beginning be matched now with your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you have to give is acceptable if, listen, if you give it eagerly, eagerly, and give in accordance to what you have and not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easier for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, you will have plenty and can share when you are in need. It is in this way, things will be equal. As scripture says, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who had gathered a little had enough. And so Paul is encouraging this church. You made this commitment a year ago. You said, hey, we want to help the church in Jerusalem. You were eager about it. Now I just want to make sure, hey, I want you to excel in this. And what we see are three principles in this text. Number one is this. He encourages them to excel in the grace of giving, to excel in this. Did you know giving is an act of grace? That's what a giver's heart is. It's all about grace. Jesus is a, is a good giver. He's a great giver. He died. He gave himself up for us, for all of mankind. And we're called to reflect his heart. And I believe one of the greatest ways we can do that is how we give. He told the church, he goes, you've grown in your love, your knowledge, your faith, your speech, and he's encouraging them to excel in this. I want you to listen to this. Giving is more for you than those that you give to. Giving is more for you than those that you give to. The Greek word excel means this, to go beyond the expected measure. To excel, to go beyond the expected measure. We live in this culture where the bar is set here and a lot of things. But 
as followers of Christ, the bar has been set pretty high by Jesus. Did you know that? He wants us to excel, to go above the expected measure. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus teaches that over and over and over on the Sermon of, on the Mount. The Bible tells us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what the Sermon on the Mount says? To love your enemy. Is that to excel? To love your enemy? Yes. We have been called as Christ followers to love our enemies. Also in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching on going the extra mile. He says, hey, if a soldier says, carry my bag one mile, how far are we to carry it, church? Two. Do you see how he wants us to excel? Jesus is not a God who has a low bar. He has a high bar. He expects us because he's a holy God. Therefore, we are being called to be a holy people. Men, do you know what it also says in uh, the Sermon on the Mount? That if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. We're like, whoa, I didn't touch her. <laughs> like the bar is low with culture, but with the Lord, it's very high. Also in Matthew chapter 18, did you know Jesus teaches on forgiveness? He teaches that you have been forgiven, therefore we are to be people who forgive others all the time. Not just a one-time deal, 70 times what does scripture say? Seven. That means we need to be forgiven all the time. You see, he wants us to excel in all parts of our life, in love, in faithfulness, how we use our skills, our, our talents that he's entrusted you with, and yes, even in how we give financially. He wants us to excel. He expects us to excel. The only way that you're gonna excel in anything in this life is through repetition. We got any uh, guys and gals that work out? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay, we got one in the back. Silver sneakers, Jenny. We're gonna pick on Jenny. Okay, so, so Jenny is the skinniest lady in church. Oh my goodness. So yes, she is super fit. Yes, and, but she is physically fit because you know what? She takes a, a lot of steps. And if you're a guy or girl and you wanna have a, a good body, you do a lot of sit-ups, you do a lot of push-ups, you do a lot of reps. And if you want to be good in anything in life, it comes through repetition, something you do over and over and over and over again. Uh, what about golfers? If you're a golfer, what does it take to be a good golfer? Repetition, right? A lot of mulligans? No, not a lot of mulligans. Now, you go out there and you have buckets of balls and you'll stand the range and you will hit balls and you will hit them until you have blisters because you want to excel in having a really good golf swing. What about a marriage? You want to have a good marriage? What does that take? Listen to your wives, men, yes, often. Yeah, there's a bumper sticker that says, happy wife, happy life. True or false? True. 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 Thank you, Patrick. Hey, I'm going to change the bumper sticker. Here's a new one for us. This is one I like. Happy spouse, happy house. Woo! Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You want to excel in your marriage? You've got to spend time, attention on fulfilling the needs of your loved one. It is repetition, something you do over and over and over. Do you want good kids? It is constant discipline. Even when you don't want to, parents. Did we get some, someone say something over here? Yeah? Preach? Okay. I'll preach on parenting. I mean, if we just whip their butts more, that'd help. No. Awesome. See, I told you a sermon on money was going to be fun today. See? I knew it. So anything in life that you want to excel in, it's something that you have to do repetitive. And Paul teaches this to the church in Corinth. And the first letter he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, this is what he says. He goes, on the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. In his income. Paul was encouraging the church to excel in this act of grace and giving money for the work of the church. And that's what we've been talking about is to provide for uh, our plans today, but also for our, our future plans as well as a church. And so I wanted to read one of the verses that I read and it's in verse 12. And this is what it says, that whatever you give, it's acceptable if you give it eagerly and give in accordance to what you have and what you don't have. Okay. So I want us to have a church building. If I had a million dollars, I would give it. But guess what? I don't have a million bucks. I don't. And so you know what? I have to give within my means. And as you are continuing to seek God and pray for us as a church to become unhindered, to have a future building, you're gonna have to pray and ask God, what is it you want me to give within my means? Within my means. When we have these discussions and teachings and sermons on money, we feel guilted and like, oh man, I should give more. Because here's what I know. You've got bills to pay, faces to feed, college to pay for. There's scads of things that we pay for. And so we are not pressuring anyone. I never want that to come across here at this church. I'm just simply, you just seek and ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And I will do it. That's been our prayer card from day one. 
But here's what I know about the culture we live in. Did you know you are the top 1% of the richest people in the entire world? If you make $32,000 or more your household annually, you are in the top 1% in the entire world. Everyone in this room, you are rich. I want you to know that. Financially. I don't know how you spend it. I don't know how you save it. That's your, I don't know what you do with it, but I want you to know you're rich. Do you know the average household income in Windsor is $90,000? 90000 That's crazy. So you know what? You guys are, you're really super rich. You're super rich. If, if that's the numbers that you walk in and live in and work for and that's your salary, I man, that's amazing. And so I don't want us to lose sight that we are, it's a rich culture we live in. It is a very rich culture. And see, I, God, he desires for us to excel in this act, not because he wants or needs our money, but because of this. Listen, he wants us to reflect his nature. And you know what? He's a gifted giver. He's a gifted giver. Number two, to prove your love genuine. Here's the hardest question I ask you all day. Do you love the Lord more or do you love money more? I'm going to ask it again because it's a really hard question. Do you love the Lord more or do you love money more? That's a super hard question to ask. It's really hard to answer. It is. It is a super challenge because culture says that money is the most important thing that you can obtain in this world. I want you to know you're not taking any of it with you. <laughs> you're not. None of us. We're not going to take anything with us. And I want you to know there's a several warnings in Scripture and why the Bible talks a lot about money. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says this, that no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and you will love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other, that you cannot serve both God and money. Money and possessions is a, an important topic in the Bible. Listen to this, 17 of the 18 parables in the New Testament have to do with money and possessions. Possessions are mentioned 2,172 times in the Bible, or about 15% of the Bible. Three times more than prayer, seven times more than love, and eight times more than belief. Here's the deal. God doesn't want or need your money. He wants your heart. That's it. And there's this tension and there's this rub between God and between money. Did you know that? I love this quote. J, uh, Richard Halverson says this, Jesus Christ said more about money than any other single thing because when it comes to a man's real nature, money is of first importance. Money is the exact index of a man's true character. All through scripture, there is an intimate correlation between the development of a man's character and how he handles money. Listen, church, God is a jealous God. He wants your affection. He wants your adoration. He wants your worship. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't need it. He doesn't. We think that God's biggest competitor is Satan. Satan is not a competitor of ours. On the cross, Jesus said these very, very words. He says, it is finished. And he said, he's a serpent. And he's taken his heel. And he stomped him out. It is done. Satan's not a competitor. Who is our competitor as Christ followers? It's the almighty dollar. That is fighting for your affection. It is fighting for your worship. It is fighting for your adoration. And I want you to know it is very hard. It is hard. If we are being completely honest and transparent with another, man, this is a, is a battle. And the things of this world, most of them are immoral. They're not bad in themselves. Money is not bad. Money is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a tool to do really cool things, whether they take your family on vacation, provide food for your family, give to those in need. It is simply a tool, but yet, man, it fights for our affection. It fights for our affection. We prove our love genuine by this, by giving our first and best to the Lord. Is your first and your best in your life, is it in pursuing money and obtaining money, or is it Pursuing God. Number three, meet the needs of others. That's what it says in verse 15. Meeting the needs of others was central to Jesus' ministry. Central. Listen to this. He opened the eyes of the blind. He helped the lame walk. He cast out demons. He removed spots from the lepers. And then the greatest need ever of all time was to restore and redeem man back in a relationship with God the Father. And so what did he do? Jesus was a gifted giver and he stretched out his arms on a cross and he was nailed to it and he shed his blood for you because he loves you. Because here's the deal, he doesn't want your money, he wants your heart. That's all he wants. He wants your heart. If Jesus gave up his life for you so you can be forgiven, so you can be redeemed, 
Are you willing to give up the things of this world to pursue God? It's only a question that you can answer. I can't answer it for you, and the person next to you can't answer that question as well. You see, this greatest need was met by Jesus through his death, burial, and the resurrection. It's called the gospel. It's the good news. It's the hope that I have. It's the hope that I teach about. And it's the only hope. Because you know what? If you put your hope in the almighty dollar, you're going to be disappointed. Because here's the deal. It's never enough. It's not, it's not enough. But man, if this relationship with Jesus over here, he said it's finished. It, it's enough. We don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. All you need is... Jesus. That is all you need. Do you believe God wants us to reach more people for our community? Do you believe God wants to grow our faith? And do you believe that God wants us to be a bigger blessing to our community? Do you believe that? I believe with all my heart. I believe with everything. And I believe one of the greatest needs that we can do together as a church is work together and give to unhindered so we can have a future place to call our own so how do we become these gifted givers? How do we become more like Jesus? Do we get more money? Nope, that's not the answer. Do we get a second job? Nope, that's not the answer. Do we get rid of one of the kids? Maybe. I mean, which one can you sell for the most, you think? No, I'm just kidding. No. Some of you would actually pay people to take the kids away, right? No, I'm just kidding. Do you refinance your house? Nope, that's not the answer. Do you file bankruptcy? Nope, that's not the answer. We're dealing with the heart issue. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the very next chapter, Paul gives us this answer. And this is what it says, that you must each decide in your what? What is the word? Come on, yeah, heart. He doesn't say that you must decide in your budget. You must decide on your bank account. You must decide on your 401k. You must decide on whatever. Nope, it is a hard issue, plain and simple, that each of you have to decide. Everyone in this room, what has God put on your heart to give to the work of the church? He says this, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives what? What is the word there? Cheerfully. Do you give cheerfully? So the Greek word cheerfully is hilaros. That's where we get our English word hilarious. Do you find giving hilarious? Like, did you wake up this morning and thought, I can't wait to get to church so I can give? Maybe. If I, most people probably didn't. They're probably like, man, I can't wait because Patrick's going to have an amazing sermon today. No, they probably came and was like, no, I want to hear Caleb and the worship team sing, and hopefully they sing my favorite song. That's probably what you wanted today when you walked in here. It's like, that's what I want, right? We probably didn't think about being a hilarious giver. So when I think of hilarious, I think of comedians. I love comedians. Uh, two of my favorite, uh, Kevin Hart. Any Kevin Hart fans here? Yes. Jack Black? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I can't even look at those two and not laugh hilariously. Like, really, like, you just like, look at them, and they can say nothing. They can grin. They can smile. I just like Nacho Libre. Just think of stretchy men in pants and tights, right? Like, yes, you Nacho Libre fans. You know who you are. Um, but I look at those two guys and it's just, it's hilarious. It's this cheer and joy that comes over me when I see them. And what if our heart was turned to that forgiving? Like we have this huge need. We need, we need a building church. Look at this room. This is one service and it's packed. We, we need a facility. That is a great need for us as a church. And I want to do it not out of pressure. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not even going to ask you next week because next week is Commitment Sunday where you're going you're gonna to worship by giving your commitments into the church. And I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to ask you the next week, what did you give? Is it a, no, that's, that's not my place. This is between you and the Lord. He goes on to say this, and God will generously provide all you need. Do you believe that? It's a promise in scripture. He'll give you what you need. Hold on to that. Money will not give you what you need. Money gives you a lot of problems sometimes. <laughs> a lot of problems. But God says, I will generously give what you need. And it, that's his response and how we give cheerfully to him. So what is it going to look like for us as a church to become cheerful givers? What is it going to look like for us as a church to be these gifted givers? Chuck Swindoll, he's a, an older preacher, and he's got the voice of God. I don't know how else to say it. If you've listened to Chuck Swindoll, there's some uh, older generations in our church here, and you probably know him. You probably listened to some of his sermons. And when he speaks, he's like one or two or three preachers I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, if God had a voice, that's what it would sound like. Like, he's amazing. And I love him. He's a great, great preacher. I came across this quote this week, and he was teaching on giving. And he says, here's some things for you to reflect on 
and how you give. And here's some of the questions, and I want to just read these with you. You may want to take a picture with your phone and reflect on these this week, but here's just a few. Number one is this, do I really believe there's a need? Do you believe there's a need for us as a church to have our own location? I believe with all my heart, we, we need it, absolutely. Number two, am I responding out of pressure or because I really care? I care for people a lot. That's why I do what I do. I love the Lord. I love people. I love the church, people who know Jesus, and I love people who don't know Jesus. And I want as many people in my lifetime to come to a place where they're going to surrender their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And with the building, guess what? We can reach more people for Jesus. Is my gift an appropriate expression of my income, or is it a more of a last minute, unplanned, get it over with act? I love that very first part. Isn't it an appropriate expression of my income? If we're all making $90,000 a year as a household income, is your giving reflecting of that kind of money that you make? I don't know. I don't know what you give. But that's something for you and for me to ask ourselves. Is what I'm giving appropriate expression of my income? Have I prayed or is this impulse giving? The very beginning of this message series, the sermon series, I gave you a prayer card. And I've, I challenge you to start praying. There's one line on the back of this card with a prayer that says... Um, Lord, what do you want me to do and I will do it? Many of you have prayed that prayer. You've been faithful. God, what do you want me to do and I'll do it? You've been praying, you've been praying, you've been praying. Some of you, you're scared to pray because you're afraid of what God might ask you to give. And I want to challenge you to the week. If you have not prayed this prayer, I want you to pick up this card on your way out. There's these prayer dots and start putting them on everything. And every time you see something, you just pray, God, what is it you want me to do? This last week, I, I asked you to start putting your prayer dots on social media. And where are you putting your prayer dots? I saw uh, the handle on the toilet was one of them. That was really cool. Uh, there's a guy in our church that's in law enforcement. He put uh, his prayer dot on his gun. How cool is that? That's awesome. I'm a pastor, so I don't, I don't, have a, I don't carry a gun on Sundays, but I'm going to put them on all mine. That'd be kind of fun, right? Uh, I saw laptops. I saw phones. We put them on our coffee maker. We put it on our refrigerator. I just wanted to keep praying this prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? And I will do it. So Chuck Swindle, he continues to just say this. He goes, am I generally thrilled about what God is doing in my life as well as through my giving? Wow, is God thrilled in your giving? I have never thought about that question ever in my lifetime. And I've thought about that many times this week. The last one, does generosity characterize my life? If you were to die today and your funeral service was this afternoon, what words would they use to describe your life? Faithful, loving, caring, compassionate, merciful, generous. I never thought about that as a word that I would want to be spoken over me at my funeral one day. That man, Patrick was generous. He was a generous man. He was a generous family. He had a generous church. Man, that's what I want our lives to be all about. So with this unhindered initiative, uh, leaders lead. That's what we do. And we, we set the course. Uh, we build the momentum for this. And so what we've done is we, uh, we've had two gatherings with the elder staff and the ministry leaders of this church. And so on, in September, the first Saturday in September, we cast vision for what we were doing and why. And why is this important for us to have our own location? Because we want to reach more people for Jesus and we want to grow your faith and we want to be a bigger blessing to our community. Last Wednesday night, we gathered all those leaders back up and we, we did what was called advanced commitment. We had 21 families give in their commitments ahead of time because leaders lead. And we, we got to put our money where our mouth is, is the old saying, right? Well, I want you to know the leadership of this church, we are absolutely committed to what we are doing here at this church. And I just wanted to share with you uh, some information. At our advanced commitment made from our meeting this last week, the leadership has increased over and above their current level of giving by 75%. That's a huge number, church. If you're still trying to think, is that a big number? That is huge. So let's say, for instance, because I'm not good at math, if you gave $100 last year, this next year, those families are going to commit to giving $175. 75% is a massive number. Listen to me, church. The leadership here, we believe in what we're doing. And they have committed wholeheartedly. But this is what's even cooler. Listen to this. Of the 21 advanced commitments... 21 of them, seven of them, of the 21, they've committed over a 100% increase in their giving. Some doubled and tripled what they're gonna give. Because you know what? They have gifted hearts. They are, they're gifted givers. 
I don't know where you are at in this. I don't know. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know your life. I don't know what's going on in your world. But I've, I know we've been called to reflect God and being gifted givers. And so maybe you're standing right here and you're a reluctant giver. Here's my prayer for you if you're a reluctant giver. I just want you to take one step over and to become a casual giver. From you to step from here to here, it's gonna take an act of God. It was an act of God in my life. Our biggest fights, my wife and I, our biggest fights, the knockdown drag out fights were over one thing, money. Every time, we would literally, this is the truth, church, we would literally drive to church and we would fight and argue the whole way to church on what we were gonna put in the plate that day. And then we'd walk in church and the people were like, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, we're doing so great. Love her. This is amazing. God bless your little heart, right? Mm. <laughs> but five minutes earlier, we were literally at the top of our lungs fighting. I'm like, we need to give this. No, we've got this and this. And I'm just like, boom, 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 boom. And we were reluctant givers. And we decided to make this decision about 10, year, 10 years ago. We're done with that. I'm tired of fighting over money. Let's just give to God what he desires from us and then he's going to bless us and take care of us. And you know what? I haven't missed a meal since. My kids haven't missed a sporting event. We go on some really good vacations. Like, he's a generous God, church. And so maybe, maybe you're right here and you're a casual giver. Maybe my prayer for you is that you just move up to be a thoughtful giver. Like, I'm going to start giving systematically. I'm going to start giving my first fruits, the very first part of my check. Like, I'm just going to give it to God. And I'm going to trust him that he's going to provide for us what we need to do. Or maybe you've been a thoughtful giver your whole life. You've been in church and you've been giving faithfully. But man, you, God's going to stretch you to be this gifted giver, the 5% where you're just like, God, you put this number in my heart and I don't know what it means, but it's big and it scares me to death. But my trust is not in money. It is in you and you alone. And so I'm going to give to this work because I believe what we're doing as a church. It's in this unhindered season that we as a church that I want us to move beyond where we're at now. I just want God to take you to this next step because I believe this is a church of gifted givers. I've seen it. Our leadership believes in what we're doing. And we as a church, we can, if we begin to live like this, guess what? We are going to become unhindered. We don't have to worry if they're going to host a Halloween party in here or anything else. We don't have to come into our church and know that our classrooms are ready for our kids. Our kids are sitting over here in service with us today. Did you see this? <laughs> There's not a place for them over there. That room is a wreck. It's an absolute wreck. I want more for you. I believe God wants more for us as a church as well. And so if we, if we step into this, I believe we're, we are truly gonna become unhindered. Last week, last several weeks, I've been talking about your commitment card. Next week is Commitment Sunday, and I want to invite every one of you to come back. I want you to be here for this. We're going to take our commitment cards, and we're going to put them on the altar. And we're going to say, God, I'm, I'm ready to step into this. I want, to, I want to make this a reality for our church, because we don't yet have this for our church or our community. And so this week, I want you to take your card, and I want you to fill in the number. What did you give last year? And then, God, what am I going to commit to give starting December 1st to this church and to the work that we're doing here? And I want you to pray and seek God. And whatever the number is, just fill it out. True story, two families I talked to after our advanced commitment on Wednesday night, two people had numbers in their mind. They had it on their card. After they turn, before they turned their cards in, they changed their number and they increased their giving because that's what God called them to do. I'm gonna be praying that God stirs in your hearts for you to just take that next step in this area of giving. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. I am so grateful for today. I am thankful that you are a gifted giver, God. That is your heart that reflects you, that you did not withhold anything. You gave your best and your all through Jesus. And Lord, I wanna be the kind of church that we give our best, God, not just in financial giving, but in our time and our talents, everything of this earth, God, that is, it's not ours, God, it's yours. You, you've just given it to us. You've entrusted us to be good stewards of it, to use it, to make you famous, use it to grow our faith, Lord. And so I pray right now for every person that is in this room, God, that you would, you would speak to them in a way that would compel them, that would move them, that would stir them, Lord, to take this next step in the area of giving financially, God. It's a hard conversation, Lord. I know it is. There are worries, there are fears, there are doubts of how are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna take care of little Susie and little Johnny, God? I know we have those same conversations too, God. But my faith, I don't want it to be in money, God. I want it to be in you and you alone. And I want this church that our faith and trust is not in a nickel, a dime, or anything, God. It is you and you alone. And so, Lord, this week, as we seek you, as we pray individually, as we pray as families, as we pray as a church, God, I am so excited for Commitment Sunday, <laughs> what you're gonna do next week. As we come and we're gonna worship you through our gifts, and Lord, and then on the 17th of November, we're gonna celebrate, Lord, and I believe that if we all participate into this, Lord, we're gonna reach our goal of $1.2 million 
over the next two years because, Lord, I know that your desire is to reach more people, your desire is to grow our faith in you, God, and I know our desire is to reach, um, just be a blessing to our community, God. So I pray for this. We love you with this and we trust you. It's in Christ's name, amen.